Abacus Federal Savings Bank has the unique distinction of being the only institution to face criminal charges in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. But the charges against the small bank based in New York's Chinatown didn't add up. After spending months and millions to defend themselves, the Sung family's ordeal was documented in the film Abacus, Too Small to Jail, which aired on Frontline and was nominated for an Oscar. A decade after the crisis, the film informs how we view justice and responsibility. And I have producer Matt Grubbs spoke with Vera and Chantrell Sung about the trial, the film, and life after acquittal. These defendants are charged with engaging in a systematic scheme to falsify and fabricate loan applications. The little known story about the only bank prosecuted for mortgage fraud after the financial meltdown. At first you think that they're here to figure out what's going on for us. We transition to, wait a minute, maybe we're the target. A family business caught up in a national crisis. I think Americans were upset that the security against which loans were made were often fictitious. And in Abacus, there was some truth to that too. And fighting to survive. Tom is not easy to be pushed around. And my girls, they're tough, smart, capable women. It's trying for us because it's our father's legacy. And he's passed that legacy on to us. Vera and Chantrell Sung, thank you so much for coming in and, and joining us. Thank you for having us. You bet, absolutely. Um, Small Enough to Jail, that title, kind of a play on, on Too Big to Fail, um, and that's certainly kind of the way that the film was, was set up. Does it still feel that way to you, that, that dynamic? Definitely. Um, it, we always feel that the big banks are treated differently in a sense than um, the small banks. Um, and we often wonder if there's another crisis like we had in 2008. Um, we still have the big banks there. Small banks like us, um, you know, definitely are going to have a hard time weathering that. And the question is, is how would we be regulated? How, how will we respond to all of that at that time? Will we be, we are small enough to jail, essentially, big, big, to big banks are, are, are um, too big um, to fail. Sure, sure. Um, as this was going on, um, did it sort of seem to have that dynamic to you? I, I'm sure you were so in what was going on. I mean, this is something that took up years. Um, did, it, did you sort of recognize the importance of what was happening? Yes, and absolutely in terms of the prosecution itself, you know, we've always asked ourselves, why did this happen to us? And, you know, there are many theories. Was it a classic example of the big guy, big guy going after the little guy? Um, was it about politics, the district attorney trying to make a name for himself by being the first DA to indict a bank after the financial crisis? Um, was it about the fact that the collateral consequences to this community, the Chinatown community in New York, um, wouldn't be so great, uh, and therefore it would be a case that um, a prosecutor would feel they could go after um, and not have to suffer from the ramifications of that. So definitely that small enough to jail uh, type of framework or mindset you know, we thought about throughout the case. Um, we see a, a picture of the Chinese American community in New York um, that's a very tight-knit community, but also in some ways it seems to be like a, a community apart. Um, and, and maybe that's why it was seen as something that, that the district attorney at that time could go after. I mean, does, it, does that sort of resonate? Yeah, I mean, when, when you say community apart, you mean one that isn't as integrated into the rest. With the rest of society in New York, yeah. Yeah, we, um, for a long time, you know, my father, especially, who's gained the trust of, a, of the community itself, has always felt like we need a, a bigger voice, a greater voice. Um, we have to be more unified. We have to get out and, and vote. And people have to know that, that we exist. Um, we are literally, you know, a foot away from the district attorney's office. The, the Chinatown uh, in New York, in Manhattan, is literally right alongside of um, the, the courthouse. And so, you know, it's been, I think, something that the community has had to work through um, in terms of making sure that we have a voice uh, and aren't forgotten. I don't know if you want you to You know, I think we're making that. more strides now and trying to get more elected officials, being Asian Americans and representative of our community, it's a question of trying to get uh, people to pay attention to us and our needs and not to marginalize us. We constantly feel that way. Okay. Um, 
viewing um, the film, it, because it's happening in New York City, I think there's a tendency for people who don't live in New York City to think like, oh, this is like at the center of it all. But this was the local DA, and this is a small bank. Um, so it really sort of crystallized things because you were the only bank um, to, be, to be prosecuted as a result of the financial crisis. Um, when, you, when all this started and, and people at the bank started noticing that there was potential fraud or something going on, it was reported to regulators. But what you got back was not thanks. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, actually, it was a closing that I was doing, um, Matt, where I discovered the potentially that the loan, loan officer was doing something extremely inappropriate. And that's when I reported it to Jill, who's the, my sister, but also the president and the CEO of the bank. And she took it upon herself to actually s stop the closing and actually fire him pretty much immediately thereafter. Um, and then we informed our regulators. We also informed Fannie Mae. Uh, the district attorney's office got a hold of this uh, matter because the borrower, in this case, filed a complaint against the loan officer, Ken Yu, okay. for taking money from her. When the district attorney's office contacted us, we actually thought probably naively that they were there to help us uncover this um, potential wrongdoing um, that the loan officer had committed. But then at a certain point, we realized that they were coming after um, the bank, that the bank was actually the target. Um, and as this is going down, you're working in yes. the district attorney's office. Yes. What was that like? It was completely surreal and um, really disheartening um, and, and frustrating because, you know, I was trained, I felt, by the very best in that office on how to be a good prosecutor how to exercise proper discretion. Um, you know, prosecutorial discretion is something that is very serious and you hold the keys to both doors. If you don't have evidence to go forward, you don't. And oftentimes that might mean dismissing a case. If you do have evidence that you can prove a crime beyond a reasonable doubt, then you prosecute. But, you know, what I was seeing before my very eyes against my family and our business and employees in the bank was that these principles and ethics were not being followed and there were decisions along this entire five-year prosecution that um, just were being made, I think, um, you know, in terms of what the influence was from the outside, what the, what the media was going to show as opposed to what the evidence shows. And, and that was really, really frustrating. And this was a, a district attorney, Cy Vance, who um, came from a big legal family. He had just come into office, from what I understand. Um, there's a, a pretty striking scene in the movie where um, lots of bank employees are being paraded, basically perp walked. Um, and did you get, what do you, I guess, what do you make of, of Cy Vance looking back at it now? I mean, he's had some very profile mm -hmm. things. He's looking into the president right now. He's trying to get right. tax returns. Um, he went easy on Jeffrey Epstein. We have a connection to that here in New Mexico. Mm. One after Dominique Strauss-Kahn. Sort of what, what do you make of, of him and, and yeah. the, this decision? Yeah, so this, this case, um, the investigation started very early on in his career as the district attorney in Manhattan. Um, I believe it was in early 2010 when they started investigating yes. Abacus. Okay. And that was actually January 2010 when he took office after... 35 years of um, service from Robert Morgenthau. Um, and so it was very clear, uh, myself as well as my colleagues in the office felt like there was a marked change in terms of um, the influence that the press and the media would have on the office. The uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn case was one of the earliest ones I remember before Abacus okay. in which um, the uh, first deputy assistant DA actually went to the criminal court arraignment on that case against um, Dominic Strauss-Kahn to arraign the case himself. We would never have seen something like that under uh, Morgenthau. And so everyone thought, okay, this is interesting now. Like, what is, what's the district attorney's office perspective and viewpoint now on, on the press's role? And, and, you know, is that going to influence decision at a higher level that are being made on these cases? Um, I personally felt that with the Abacus case, that was something where, you know, the, the DA was going to keep that in mind. Um, the fact that no banks had been prosecuted or indicted after the financial crisis, and then he might see this as an opportunity to be the first one to, to do that. Sure. It, it seemed so obvious to us that it was a, um, it was 
orchestrated for the press to perp walk people like that, innocent people, people who have not been proven guilty by any means, strung together, never been arrested before, mostly women, um, right. to, to be um, brought down the courtroom like that. That was egregious in our opinion and really um, in, in many senses is a violation of people's um, rights, civil rights, to do that especially since you are innocent until you're proven guilty. And then to have a huge press release and basically, in essence, condemn us for being the cause of the financial crisis, that also to us was astounding that he was using the press in such a fashion. It's like a hit and run. You're, you know, you're, you're already found guilty by all this press, and now no one remembers afterwards anything else, even if you go to trial if you ever get to the trial. They see those images. Yes. And that was, sure. yeah, and, and just, um, just to briefly add to that in terms of, you know, this was just being done um, for purposes of th that image and, and like it was a stage, right? Because the th there were three uh, defendants who had already previously been arraigned. Um, their indictments were filed, unsealed, and they were already arraigned and exactly. let out on bail. And they were brought back for purposes of putting them in this chain gang and that, that, that whole parade took place literally in the courthouse hallway where they had already set up and cordoned off a special area for the press to come. So you could just see this being sort of orchestrated as a spectacle. Um, sure. Yeah. Usually and lots of pains are taken whenever I watch that there's someone being arrested to cover their handcuffs because a handcuff literally makes people... It's sticks prejudicial. In yeah, it's exactly. extremely prejudicial. Yes. Um, the, you, you see this happening in the film, and then you see sort of the family coming together. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on the family dynamic. Um, as you look back and you watch the film, sort of what do you remember about that time? So I, <laughs> I remember we were extremely focused on the task at hand, right, and, and trying to make sure that this was our, our one opportunity now to come together and to fight for what was right and to have that opportunity in court to have that be known we had to get this right so we were very laser focused and um, I think as a consequence of that we all became very united um, my whole family and, and Beer can add to this as well we've always been extremely close <laughs> just in the way that we were raised you know with our um, little arguments here and but there. I was gonna say <laughs> family yes lawyers we all, we all have right. <laughs> different personalities you know and 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 fight a lot as you could see through the film um, and laugh a lot but this really brought us all together and um, I always remember Vera would remind us even in the, in the darkest moments just remember this time because this is the time that we have to really be together every day and and we may not ever have a chance to be together every day like this and I see you're getting very emotional yeah. about it I know so when we see the film each time we've <laughs> seen it today we saw it again um, and it really reminds of a, us of a very painful time and it, it does evoke a lot of emotions mm -hmm. yeah. sure there was a, a what comes through is a very clear sense of this is wrong we're going to fight this um, did that play into the decision to allow Steve James and his camera teams to come in and, and film all this? So that was an interesting decision that we had to make. I knew um, the producer, Mark Mitten, he had been a friend of mine for a long time. Oh, okay. Then, but he hadn't been a pr producer of a film. He had worked with Steve James as a producer of Life Itself. Okay. And um, also a film, I think, that you know, PBS was involved with. Um, and after he'd done that, um, I knew Mark before he was even doing that. He was um, actually producing, he produced the second episode of The Apprentice. <laughs> oh, no that's, kidding. That's, when wow. I, okay. that's how long we knew him, and he, be, he knew our family <laughs> as well. Um, but when the trial started, that's when he actually approached our family and said, um, you know, well, actually he said to me, I can't believe there is no press on this. You are the only bank. Uh, which has been indicted in the wake of the financial 2008 financial crisis, and there's no press coverage on this. Um, and so he's, he actually went and talked to Steve James and met, Steve James came over and met us, but it was mm -hmm. a hard decision as to, met, as to whether or not we would want, it, it's intrusive to have sure. this documented and um, filmed 
and especially yeah, since even we, just being a distraction you know oh so, right so being followed around by camera and like you know as it as it was it was hard to find enough hours in the day between our regular jobs and then fighting this case so that was another reason we were hesitant very hesitant really. but then we did it then we did um, as a family come together and decided that well this is important and that it should be documented even if we would lose maybe even more reason why this should be documented. Sure. Yeah, there, there, oh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say there, there came a point in time where we realized obviously we were fighting this for our, our family business and, and the reputation of the family but that this was a much larger cause that you know as to why we were doing this it was for the community also for what the, the criminal justice system is stands for and so I think that's why we felt like if you're innocent the system should it should work right and so and if it doesn't even if the outcome is not in our favor that in itself should be documented as well for the lessons that could be learned from it absolutely and you make a point of um, as a family, like we have to, we have to have everything. You, you know, we have to have not guilty on everything. They just need one thing to claim a victory. Right. Um, going into the courtroom that last, uh, was it an afternoon or morning when the jury it was came an back? Afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and having that in the back of your mind. I mean, did you have to stand there as they listed all of these charges? Yes. Yeah. We we were seated, and the jury came down in I think two days because there were so many counts oh, and, okay. and there were three defendants it was the bank as a corporation and then the two employees and so the two employees were acquitted the first day okay which was good that that was good right because their actual liberty um, was at stake okay and that then, so that was a sense of relief there. once they were acquitted and then it was the second day the rest of the verdict started coming down but we were waiting for the, the final ones, and right. that, that that was the afternoon we sat there and just my parents. We heard were there. eighty some counts had to be read, and the four lady had to read them out, and we had to listen to that, um, mm -hmm. and it then it had to be repeated again. Yeah. Yeah, they pull the jury, and then they repeat um, what the jury. Okay. It, it's a shame that yeah, I mean that the what, we, I wish that this had been part of the documentary. It would have been so interesting if the documentary um, could have actually had scenes of that final day but um, the judge was very fair he said to both sides um, you know are you comfortable with footage in the courtroom and either side was not comfortable with having camera in the courtroom oh, okay. for a number mm -hmm. of reasons that's why you see um, these great sketches by uh, Christine Cornell she okay did, yeah to reenact the court scenes sure yes. But that was my favorite moment of the trial. I bet. <laughs> I bet. At being a prosecutor, well, right, to have that many counts <laughs> right. acquitted, I knew what that meant for the And what it feels like to, to hear and, that on yes. the other side when they're yes. like, oh, this is completely going But anticipation, so. Chantrell, when the judge said, we have a verdict, oh. I do remember that. I, I <laughs> thought really? I was going to feel sick. Yeah, I really do. But at that point, you realize you've done everything you could. Yes. It's you over, yes. yeah. There's that sense, yeah. too. Yeah. So after um, the film closes and real life comes back, how long did it take to sort of start feeling normal? Hmm. I'm not sure I <laughs> have felt really normal really? since then. Yeah. Um, it's hard to feel normal. Um, you don't feel normal because, um, much to my mother's surprise, the film was actually made. She didn't believe that the documentary <laughs> film would ever be made. So one year later, we find ourselves at the Toronto Film Festival, and they prepared um, the documentary. And that was one of the most, I, I, the, when we went to see it, because it's the first time we saw it in its full form. And I, I will never forget, I think there were 700, so 800 people in the audience, yeah. strangers who we did not know. And after the film was over, they stood up and gave a standing ovation. Yeah. It was wow. one of the most emotional moments because you've been living for so long with, you know, you're, you know, you're terrible. You've done all these awful things. You've been accused right. of all these things. Then you go through a trial that basically takes everything from you physically, mentally, emotionally, um, you know, a, a, as well as bank wise, business wise. Sure. And now you win and then you tried to build back your business and then you have a documentary film and all these people finally see what happened and are actually on your side and, yeah. you know, applauding. You so don't get you, those applause in the no, courtroom, you for sure. Never, <laughs> you know, and so, and that's, so that's not a normal feeling. And, yeah. and then from there on in, um, 
and then getting the film getting Oscar uh, nominated was such a tremendous experience in and of itself. So grateful to Steve James, to um, Cartemquin Motto Pictures, PBS, you sure. know, everybody involved with the film. So no, we haven't felt really normal. <laughs> normal is something yeah. completely different. Is this a new different. norm? Yeah. I right. don't know, <laughs> yes. Sure. Well, we've, le we've learned so much from this experience, you know, and, and that's, I think, the most important part. I think, personally, for me, it's still hard on a, a small scale, for example, just even walking by the DA's office, yes. where this was a job that I had wanted. It was my dream job, you know, and I often had thought about having a lifelong career there. Um, but, um, you know, I walk by the office, I know I have great friendships, lasting friendships from there, but I still have a little bit of PTSD when I walk by. But on a large scale, we've, we've grown so much, and um, as a family, we feel that even though something so negative happened, this is now, a, we've been given a platform, so to speak, to have a voice for, for, cha for positive change. And so we really try to incorporate that mentality into you know, our, our everyday now. And my sisters are extremely involved in, um, in a lot of community efforts in, in Chinatown now, as well as my father. And you know, so something that we, we try to work on every day. That's great. Well, thank you so thank much you for coming in. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes.